They said it wouldn't last, and they said that you can't drive profitable and incremental revenue through the affiliate channel. But here we are, 20 years later, and the affiliate channel is alive and kicking and generating profitable revenue for thousands of retailers across the globe. Hi, I am Jamie Birch, your host of the Profitable Performance Marketing Podcast, where we talk to some of the industry's best and brightest about their careers, about leadership, and about how to drive profitable revenue through the affiliate channel. All right, today we have a special guest, Mustafa Mira. He's the senior digital journalist at Performance In. Uh, but before I talk to you about him and intro you to the episode, just wanna let you know, if you are running an affiliate program and you need help, uh, we have put together a 20-step guide on the affiliate marketing strategies to survive and thrive. That ebook is available for you at jebcommerce.com slash strategies. And we go over everything. Right now, I'm recording this intro, and we are in July, the end of July 2020, uh, and still dealing uh, very much in the thick of COVID and the pandemic. And a lot of people are wondering, you know, what do I do? So we put together that document. Not only do you get the document when you go to jebcommerce.com slash strategies, you also get 19 videos. One of them is an interview with one of our affiliate vendors, but 19 videos that more thoroughly explain each topic. So if you need help at this time, you want to make sure your affiliate program is set up for success. Go to jebcommerce.com slash strategies, download your ebook. Now, if you'd like to spend some time with me personally, helping you make sure that your strategy is on point and ready to go uh, for the new normal and uh, the coming rebound, you can uh, contact me at gethelp at jebcommerce.com and we'll set up some time. You can also just access my, calen uh, my calendar at calendly.com slash Jamie Birch and set up 15 minutes to an hour uh, for us to spend time going through uh, your unique situation and how we can help. So on to today's discussion. I'd love this discussion. It was enlightening. Uh, it was encouraging. Uh, and it was with someone who I've just recently met, but I'm really, really glad to have uh, spent some time with uh, Mustafa. He's a senior digital journalist at Performance In. He has a really cool background. We we talk about some things we have in common we didn't know, uh, some covering uh, journalistic wise of uh, music scenes in our, uh, our respective areas. Uh, he is in Bristol, United Kingdom. Um, so we also talk about race, diversity, uh, and inclusion in the performance marketing space. Uh, recently, Mustafa wrote an article about that on his LinkedIn page. We will include links to that in the show notes. So we talk about race, we talk about diversity, we talk about what our industry as performance marketers can do and should be doing uh, to help out uh, those marginalized classes. And then we dive into what trends he sees as a journalist covering uh, affiliate marketing and performance marketing globally. He has a really unique perspective on what's working, what's not, what people are saying, what the future holds. So let's just dive right into our conversation. I hope you enjoy this and uh, learn as much as I did from Mustafa today. So let's get into our conversation. Mustafa, good morning. Actually, good evening to you. Thank you so much for being on my Profitable Performance Marketing Podcast. It is, uh, It has been a pleasure to meet you um, during our webinar, but it is awesome. I've been looking forward to this conversation all week. Cool. No, thanks, Jamie. Thanks for uh, inviting me to your podcast. And yeah, good to catch up again uh, following the webinar we did just last month. Yeah, it's great. And so you, why don't you give us a little introduction, uh, and, and for our listeners, um, you, you, right now you are the senior digital journalist at Performance In. How did you become a, uh, a journalist and a journalist in the affiliate marketing field? Yeah, for sure. Um, it's quite, quite a story actually um, I'll, I'll try to keep it concise <laughs> um i'll try to give it as much as i can so essentially i mean in terms of kind of studying and i guess my background wasn't actually initially journalism so i kind of started off kind of from business and marketing um kind of studying at college and university so um yes yeah, so i kind of studied those and then ended up kind of graduating 
as you do, you know, you graduate, you get you get your um, sort of diploma or um, your degree in this case, and mm-hmm. you sort of kind of go out to the field of um, into work, you know, thinking you're going to get your sort of dream job and, you know, you've got your degree, you're, you're raring to go, um, that kind of thing. So this was kind of around, say, between 2009, 2012, university, um, got your education ready. And then sort of going out to the real world, hoping to get my dream job. Fortunately, that didn't quite go to plan, I guess. Um, with the we were sort of going through our, particularly in the UK at the time, was kind of our post post recession. Um, you know, two thousand eight was kind of our main. You know, we had a recession, so in terms of our economic climate, it was pretty bad then. Um, but sort of things kind of peaked, I guess, or kind of started to perk up again around twenty twelve. So this is when I graduated. So in terms of finding work particularly in the field of sort of business and marketing was particularly um, challenging, I would say. So, um, yeah, despite with my degree and vice versa, and I, I think I, I lost count on how many job interviews I had. It was, it was quite, <laughs> quite a list. Um, but ev- ev- eventually it kind of, um, I guess, didn't work out. So I had a lot of um, kind of free time on my hands. Um, you know, I was just kind of, I was just kind of working um, in the old job at the time. And this is kind of around 2013 and because I had so much free time in my hands, I ended up kind of, I guess it was kind of a way of writing my frustrations. Um, so I ended up just kind of writing um, on a pen, you know, classic uh, you know, pen and pad, um, even just like, you know, using Word doc on um, on a laptop and just kind of writing words, I guess, um, in, a, in a sense that, you know, um, kind of just writing, you know, what's been happening in terms of, you know, you know what I was going through, what was um, kind of around me in sort of today's climate at the time. And I was like, oh, actually, I quite like expressing myself, you know, in a writing format. So I was kind of thought, you know what, have a look, look around for some blogs, um, you know, kind of what's blog, you know, what is blogging? And I've noticed that, you know, people, there was blog, you know, there's a, such a concept called blogging and people write, you know, write blogs or have their own websites, that kind of thing. And um, and I thought, this is quite interesting. You know, this is really good. And then I sort of just did a bit of research and I thought, this is going to be a whole kind of new degree. I've got to you know, start studying again, that kind of thing. So, but no, I, I was enjoying it. So I had a lot of free time in my hands. So that was kind of what I spent my time doing. Um, but then in terms of uh, music, so this is where music gets involved. It's a bit interesting here. <laughs> so, um, awesome. so, so in terms of music, so I live in Bristol, uh, which is um, in England in the United Kingdom. And Bristol is very known for its music scene. It called genres kind of around sort of trip hop, um, sort of indie bit of grunge. Um, kind of, kind of drum and bass, and a bit of hip hop as well. So it's quite a merge of genres, um, particularly when I was growing up. So uh, Bristol has a very kind of diverse um, music scene, and kind of um, because I was back home in Bristol uh, when I studied at uh, university, I studied in the Midlands. So when I returned back home to Bristol, um, I sort of just kind of popped around some gigs. Um, I, I was, I, I was act, I was an active listener of music, but I wasn't really much of a gig goer. Um, at the time so I went to a few local gigs and I thought oh, this is yeah really great quite refreshing to see live music um, and then I guess I kind of started writing about how I felt about these live gigs um, I remember I can't remember, the, <laughs> I can't remember the band but I guess um, I went to a couple of local venues just nearby me and you know and I thought one of them was a jazz band um, and then I was like this is great I, I've got to write about this and then I just wrote about it I guess and then I was like this is uh, this is this is great and then i was like, i'm kind of studying how to kind of blog and write and then going to gigs and like, why not you know write about it so i ended up kind of starting a personal blog i started writing about my gig journeys i guess <laughs> um, right on which is good yeah so um i mean this was just it was all just kind of personal it wasn't like i didn't think of anything to it at the time and um yeah so i was going yeah go to these gigs and start writing about them as i go afterwards and i was like maybe I should start a music blog. And um, and then that's what I kind of did. So I kind of started a music blog um, in Bristol and kind of just spent my time on that um, whilst I was kind of just, you know, carrying on with day-to-day life. And then as I was doing that, um, a few sort of local artists um, kind of nearby started to notice. They were like, oh, I noticed you just wrote about my band. Um, come and check out our stuff. This is what we've got um it'd be great to you could write a review of my music and i was like well this is int-. i was like well this is interesting <laughs> i mean i'm <laughs> um i was just like yeah i mean i really just wrote about you um from my personal experience but i didn't realize you wanted um you know to kind of pass on your stuff and so that was like i guess a catalyst and then i ended up um 
actually kind of formulate so this is where i kind of did a bit more research i was like okay so what are magazines and kind of publications look like and music blogs and vice versa and i i surprised there was quite a few around bristol at the time so there was quite a few local ones and then i kind of looked at what example ones are out there and i was like maybe i should start this but do i need to kind of learn how to do all this um and then so i kind of just did all that really i a lot of it was self-taught I would say I didn't actually go back to like university again and kind of study, you know. Gen- yeah, it's, you said that a number of times. Were you like, was there a feeling of, I don't have the education for this. How could I do this that you had to overcome? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, that it had that bit of obstacle. But I was like, I spent already like three or so years uh, getting my degree. Um, and I was really just kind of proactively ready to kind of get into work. You know, I thought yeah. I'm quite a practical person. Um I learned kind of on the go uh, so I could sit there and yeah, write, read and study, you know, I could read books all day long and I, I much just love reading. Of course I love reading. Um, I find it better. Um, I, I remember my, uh, my father says this all the time. Um, you actually learn better from actually physically doing things, um, mm. which is, which is quite interesting. So, um, so I thought rather go through the whole study process again, I kind of just looked at, you know, and great access to like, you know, at the time you got YouTube and, you know, the internet. Yeah. It's a big, big, big wide resource. So that helped me a lot. And I guess I kind of just collated all these kind of ideas and, you know, and sort of topics that um, that I was looking at and then sort of formulated a music blog. And I sort of kind of, you know, thought, you know, what if there's stuff around this, why, well, you know, I'll give it a shot. So, um, so that's what I did in Bristol. So I kind of started a music blog. I called it The Flux, um, which was in 2013. And sort of, yeah, it was just kind of me patrolling uh, at gigs um, and people sending me releases and stuff um, as well to kind of review and do some interviews as well. And yeah, it kind of just took off. And then next thing you know, uh, I just started to get loads of, um, you know, emails and people, you know, sending me stuff. And I was like, this is great. And then I was like, this is a bit overwhelming for, for just me to do. Um, and then I was like, how do I get more people on board with this? And then um, eventually um we actually actually i actually had a couple of people that actually caught this on they're like oh you know i've been checking out the flux um it's really good um i would love to write for you and i was like oh this is great i was like you know and then we sort of you know this is all voluntary and it kind of still is voluntary now um where we had um one you know we got one writer in and then they started writing for us and it kind of just kind of grew um organically from there and then um and then I could, you know, you could say the rest is history from there, really. It, you know, over the last kind of few years, it kind of just expanded and became a little hub uh, platform in Bristol um, that I kind of managed. And then I had, you know, more people involved in a team of some freelancers. And then, yeah, it's just become, it's, it is as it is today. It's called, we had to kind of rebrand the name uh, to tap the feed. So that's what it's called now, but it still goes strong. Um, yeah, we've got a great, great team of uh, writers and photographers, Um yeah today so it's been game changing so that kind of led me on to journalism generally and uh, today and kind of how i got into performance sin um yeah so kind of using this kind of journalism background from what i started from the blogs and the music and vice versa um it actually ended up getting me full-time employment in a couple of agencies which was great kind of working in the editorial back uh, back backdoor team and vice versa so i got some experience under my belt and i guess um when I came with stumbled across performance in, um, I um, you know, I thought I'd take the chance and opportunity when they were looking for a digital journalist. I thought this was interesting. Um, kind of, you know, going into digital because I wanted to do kind of do more digital stuff, but at the same time I had that kind of journalism element and then mm-hmm. you know, and sort of performance marketing. I mean, I was aware of affiliate marketing to a very limited degree at the time. Um, but I, in terms of uh, that industry, it was something I was kind of really keen to learn about more. So it ticked all my boxes. And then, and then uh, I think 2017, I was, um, yeah, I joined in as the digital journalist at Performance Sin. So, and then, yeah, and then we're here now, uh, still still going strong. Um, awesome. Yeah, I'm loving it. <laughs> what was your first article for for Performance Sin? Oh, I actually remember this. It was, um, oh, it was a news story about sort of video. It was to do with video advertising and display. Um, and I remember, yeah, it was like the first week I was in, and um yeah that was kind of the first news story i did um it was quite funny because i when i joined performance in it was literally a week before our um our event uh, pi live uh, which mm-hmm. is our uh, two-day um sort of annual conference we host in london so it was very very manic busy time so when i joined the team wow. 
it was like we had this schedule of interviews of all these uh you know affiliate networks and platforms and companies i was like yeah so uh, no pressure <laughs> <laughs> well uh, you know sometimes you gotta dip a toe in sometimes you gotta have someone throw you off the dock into the water <laughs> exactly exactly and i think you know i think that was the best way um you know you you go you know you've been in for about five days six days um literally brief, briefly met the team and then you're like right we're off to london for three days because we're we're running our event yeah you know, we have you know you have about two over two thousand people that turn up to this event and you got all these big sponsors mm-hmm. and companies and i was like right i've got pretty much basic knowledge of affiliate marketing and i've got to interview some of the leading companies in the space about what's going on <laughs> <laughs> so uh, no pressure at all so luckily i mean um i had a great team behind me and you know um and I had a our sort of head of content at the time was Mark Jones, um, you know, who's who's moved on now. Uh, but at the time he was there, and, you know, he through his guidance and stuff, um, kind of put me at ease, which was great. So yeah, and then yeah, after talking to these senior people and sort of CEOs and leaders and stuff, I was like, I came out of that event and I was like, I pretty much learned about thirty years of performance marketing in the space of yeah. two days. Um, it was very, it was, it was amazing. And then it kind of just, the rest of the journey has just been amazing since. Yeah. During that first few days at, at the conference, what was the biggest thing you, you learned about, uh, yeah, affiliate marketing, the industry? Oh, um, I think just like how, I think for me, it was kind of the whole partnership, I guess the partnership sort of, you know, the, the, um, kind of the way that, you know, the affiliate program works and the relationship between the publisher and the, um, the advertiser and how the kind of networks or platforms as well kind of all integrate i mean that was the main thing for me it was kind of like it sounds pretty basic but i yeah but actually you know seeing actual advertisers or publishers at the event and Mm -hmm. sort of you know seeing you know what you know what they're kind of looking for and then the exhibitors as well because you know then it was showcasing their products and stuff and then kind of you know you know integrating and saying you know you know, this is how our product works. This is how the advertisers can benefit. You know, you integrate their programs, becoming more incremental with their traffic and vice versa. Um, yeah, I think it was just kind of like, yeah, I knew how the, the our basic mechanics work, but it was actually these these players or these companies at the show and you know the delegates, these advertisers, publishers. These are the people that are in the, you know, they're in in the circle. So it's really for me, it was kind of the whole program, literally the program management. I think was the kind of big takeaway I've got from it. Yeah. And, you know, we, we send a lot of our new staff to conferences for the sole reason of immersion. Yeah. You, 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 we can recre- recreate a lot of, you know, face-to-face interactions with tools that we have. Zoom has been tremendous during, you know, the last couple months. Um, but there's something missing about sharing a coffee or, you know, just face to face sitting down and talking about, you know, what are you looking for? What do you need? And, and, uh, you know, learning about each other. It's, it's really hard to replace that. Yeah, of course. And I, I, I do miss that as well. Um, you know, given yeah you know, today with the, uh, you know, what's going on around the world, with the pandemic and stuff, you know, it's been, yeah. you know, I mean, it's great connecting with everyone virtually. And I think you got to benefit technology here. Um, it's been absolutely you know, lifesaver, even game changer, you can say, uh, for some, for you know, for most of us. So it's been really good. But yeah, that face to face value. Um, I mean, especially as a journalist as well. You know, your journalist's job is to network and sort of discuss, have conversations with people, finding out you know what's working, what's not working, and you know, it's giving them a voice and giving them that kind of spotlight. So I do miss that. Um, so yeah. you know, I get that from going to gigs as well. You know, as a you know, you mm-hmm. write about this as a journalist from a you know, gigs perspective. It's exactly the same with um, conferences. You know, you're there meeting, you know, the industry. It's, it's great, you know, having phone calls and stuff and, you know, reading about it. But, you know, if you go to these conferences um, and, you know, that's where you meet meet the industry all in one go. So, yeah, hopefully it will get back to that soon. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. You know, we have something in common that uh, I just remembered as we're talking about this. I covered the music scene in uh, in 92 and 93 in Seattle for my high school paper. And <laughs> I, uh, uh, I wrote an article where I got on stage with Morrissey at, I believe, the Paramount Theater in Seattle. Uh, and I paid the security guy. Um, I saw guys, I was up on the right side of the stage and I saw people 
um, basically paying to get up on the stage. So I, I kind of moseyed my way up there and I was like, all right, um, I want to get on the stage with Morrissey. And he said, uh, well, what do you got? And I just pulled out this wad of cash and I'm 17 at the time, maybe 18 and I'm broke. And I just have a couple ones, but I pulled them out and, you know, I wasn't, I just stuffed money in my pocket for this trip, knew I was covering it for the paper and uh, I gave him everything I had. And I think it was $7 and he just, <laughs> he just felt this, you know, bundle of cash and let me on the stage. And I running up to uh, get next to uh, uh, Morrissey and the biggest man I've ever met in my life grabbed me by the back of the neck and threw me in, uh, in the, in uh, oddly enough, Morrissey had a mosh pit, but it was a great experience, a great <laughs> article. And, and, you know, you were, it sounds like in Bristol, you were at a, a an inflection point of a bunch of different music happening. Um, and that was happening, uh, at that time too. uh, alternative, uh, alter alternative rock and grunge music was getting big. So we saw some killer bands in backyards and, uh, things like that. So as you're telling that story, I, I, I gotta tell this one too. <laughs> oh, that's an amazing, I'm kind of jealous actually, Morrissey as well in the early days. I mean, that's, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, uh, is a unique individual. Um, he had a rockabilly kind of hillbilly band open for him, uh, which just threw everybody off. And, uh, and then there was a mosh pit, a, a full out mosh pit at a Morrissey concert, which blew my mind, but we had fun. It was a good time. Now, I wanted to be a journalist in the mold of, uh, you know, uh, to, to take down corruption and uh, quickly found out that uh, trying to find that in my high school was very difficult uh, and there really wasn't any. Uh, so I learned a lot of lessons in that. What did you, did you learn anything about journalism as you embarked on that now looking back seven years uh, into, into your career? Is there, are there any, any sort of preconceptions about journalism that kind of, you know, got shattered in, in the last seven years? Yeah. Oh, I would probably say, um, I mean, the fee I guess the feedback we've, I've got over the years is that if I look back at my writing now, probably seven years ago to what it was now, I'd be like, I look, actually, I think I did this quite recently and I was like, what on earth was I writing? <laughs> was like, there, was no, there was no kind of structure. It was all just, um, very just, it was just fluff i could say um mm -hmm. so um yeah. i guess um i think the key thing is kind of um you know it's that professionalism side of things you know especially you know especially if you've self-taught your way through and i think you know it's, it's actually getting your language across um i remember growing up actually i think i was a very little kid um growing up and i think out of my family i was the um out the siblings i it took me a while to actually pick up the um speak properly which is quite strange mm. So I had trouble with my words. So it's kind of like a bit ironic to, you know, for somebody who was struggling with his, you know, with speaking and writing, oh, yeah. day two and three, and now he's writing as a journalist. It's quite, it's quite crazy. So um, I think the key things really for me, what stood out um, massively was kind of, I guess, the professionalism side of things and also kind of the English language, um, you know, learning to kind of write in a, in a way that sort of communicates and, resonates with your audience um and i think you know the feedback i've been uh, getting and we still get i still get it today through the music blog and also our you know not just myself but you know our team of writers as well is that our writing is very authentic you know it's very organic you know it's not just like you know your typical kind of um you know we're open and honest yeah you know, we're not set you know we don't just write glossy reviews for the sake of glossy reviews you know um yeah. you know if, but you know we you know we always keep an honest opinion like if we say you know if the show was bad we will say in a constructive i mean that's a keeping construct constructive uh if i got that right constructive i can't say it constructive uh, criticism yeah constructive criticism and i think being constructive yeah. i mean that's probably the biggest um thing i've learned um kind of as a writer um, and in journalism and even today at performance in you know you, you know to be critical and especially with you know when you have you know doing the thought thought pieces and opinion and sort of discussions as well it is being critical um obviously you can't go over the line you know you don't want to upset people yeah. but at the same time you you got to keep a, a, a balance and i think that's what kind of keeps the discussion going so i would say that's probably been the biggest thing for me um right yeah as well as the kind of you know you know getting the language and you know professional professionalism right of it but definitely the constructive criticism 
for sure. Yeah, and you know, it's so easy in in today's day and age of you know social media, and uh, it's it's just so easy to go over that line and just trash someone. Um, and I always felt like, as journalists, uh, you know, there needs to be some there needs to be an integrity to uh, the form and the medium, but also like what you said, like there's a difference between critique and trashing and, uh, and that that's really cool. Now we, we continue to have things in common. Uh, I also read, you know, as a marketer, I do a ton of writing and I have since my first job out of college, one of the things I, I wrote, uh, some things for my sister had a web development company, uh, and yesterday she wa- she was going through some boxes and found um, some material that she had put together for marketing and in it included something I wrote and she just sent me a picture of it and I read the first two lines. It was so embarrassing. <laughs> it was just like, oh, what was I doing? Fluff, like you said? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Uh, definitely fluff. Uh, I too had uh, speech issues for I, probably the first 10 or 12 years of my life, I couldn't say R. And so uh, it is kind of interesting that uh, now a lot of what I'm doing is this podcast and and hopefully I'm hitting that R uh, every time. Um, but, th- you know, that's that's awesome. One of the things, and, and you write uh, you write a lot, not only on Performance In and, and, and Tap the Feed, but recently, you know, we've had... It's just been a crazy, very turbulent time uh, since March. So we've had COVID uh, and the pandemic and all the the openings and closings and controversy here in the States. We have huge controversy over masks and things like that. But then we also have social unrest uh, here in the States. And recently you wrote an article on LinkedIn uh, titled Solidarity, What Real uh, Change Can We Do as an Industry to Support Our Communities Right Now? Is a really good, solid article. Um, Can you tell me and our listeners, like, how are you feeling when you writing that article? And what what was the general idea you were trying to get across? And and even, you know, what what is in the article as well? Of course. Um, Now, first of all, thank you um, for the kind words about the article. And I think, yeah, just going back to that point, it's been a very strange, as you mentioned, turbulent few months. Um, It's like the world's got upside down. You know, you you Mm -hmm. think about these you know, you see it in movies and stuff and you're like, you know, is that, could that really happen? But then like, but then, you know, we're kind of, you know, with this pandemic, no one predicted a pandemic was going to happen or no one predicted, yeah. you know, there's going to be civil unrest over, you know, prejudice and, you know, racism and um, injustice. And yeah, it's just been a crazy, crazy, yeah, just crazy few months. Um, but yeah, I guess, yeah, kind of go back to the article, I guess, um you know, particularly what happened in the US, um, I mean, first and foremost, you know, it, the fact that, you know, everyone was able to see that online and witness that is just sickening, really. Um, I know, I'm, yeah, you know, I'm aware, yeah. you know, racial injustice and, you know, uh, priest, priest, police brutality um, has been an ongoing thing for, the, for years in the US. Um, and, you know, everyone's aware of it. But I think, you know, what happened, um, in, I think it was towards the end of May, wasn't it, with George, uh, George Floyd, um, yeah. really resonated or sent signals ripples around the world and i think why not i remember watching that I, I yeah i remember seeing it or reading about it. i actually yeah i did watch the i watched the video um and i was like i was physically sick yeah it was just yeah. um i didn't really have any words and you know and I, I think you know i'm probably one of millions of people that you know just was just shocked and just like enough is enough so kind of go back to, i guess go back to the article was kind of you know, a couple of weeks have kind of gone by. We've had these protests. You know, we've had loads in um, in the UK. We've had one in Bristol, which we tore down a statue of a slave trader. Um, mm. <laughs> yeah, which is uh, you know a, was a symbolic moment. Um, you know, because it's oh, just yeah, yeah, it was crazy. I mean, Bristol. Uh, just a bit of history about Bristol. I mean, um, Edward Colston was kind of he built the kind of city through. Uh, you know, he brought a lot of wealth to the city, which is great. But the way he way he brought he brought the help uh, the wealth was kind of through slave trading. Um, mm-hmm. So that was kind of how he did it, um, sort of over the UK and bringing it bringing it to Bristol. Um, and that's kind of he made. So we got quite a few monuments kind of named after him. So I guess when we had these protests, um, you know, when that tear down of a statue, um, you know, it was a very symbolic moment. You know, and Bristol is a very very diverse and multicultural city. 
um especially as it is today for sure and so yeah it really resonated um and really sort of impactful but you know as i say go back to solidarity the article i wrote was kind of i remember writing this actually and i was with my colleague um online and i think it was i I believe was yes first week of june and i was i I was saying to her um you know it was a normal working day the performance in as you would and um and at the moment you know this was probably just a week after what what was going on with the what what happened with uh, in the US and the protests happening, and all these statements coming out from you know the advertising industry, all these companies coming forward saying yeah we're going to do more, um you know solidarity as an industry to you know support Black Lives Matter, support uh, diversity and inclusion, you know support black communities, and I you know th- that was a key thing that week when I wrote this article that was always you yeah, know that was always being talked about that's what everyone's prior prior prioritizing on at the time. And I was looking at my mm. inbox and I was like, you know, we'll get we we'll get messages about, you know, about new product launches and stuff. And I was like, this is completely irrelevant right now. Um, yeah, you yeah. know, and I was like, you know, I kind of felt like, it, yeah, when I wrote this article, um, it only took, it took me about probably half hour, an hour or so. It, was, it didn't take me too long. Um, but I was there just a working day and I just felt like I couldn't do anything else. This had to be done. Um, I was debating whether I um, actually wrote it on Performance Sin when it should have came from us um or i write to you know i thought i've got a lot of uh, contacts um on linkedin i've got a lot of connections particularly around the ports market industry uh, which i touched on in this article so i decided to write the article um i don't i don't, I don't often write linkedin articles so um i wrote it and i guess the idea behind it was um you know with the industry uh affiliate ports marketing you know i've been in about three years now um you know i wouldn't say i you know I, I indeed I I am um, I you know I you know I I know a lot more about the industry now than I did three years ago. But I never you know I would never put myself saying I'm a I'm a complete expert. I'm always approve yeah you know, I'm, I'm an advocate and I always ensure that um you know I do my absolute best to learn the best the best of the best of the industry um yeah through the technical side through the relationship side and I guess you know through the diversity side. So this is where the article came in. So I was hoping. Um, with the whole idea, I was hoping with the industry, kind of whoever came across and read it, uh, will kind of, I guess it's just me being open and starting to sort of take a bit of action and sort of, you know, I'm used to having discussions with people. That's my field of work. Um, and this was yeah. kind of, you know, continuing the discussions around sort of what's what's happened around the world. Um, but I, the key thing I highlighted was that, as I mentioned, you know, various companies were coming forward um in the advertising industry and digital marketing you know putting out statements saying this is what we're doing you know we're coming together we're going to you know ensure you know we do more put some policies in place educate ourselves you know um reflect you know just be more proactive and don't get me wrong uh yeah with performance marketing you know diversity um in this area you know there's people in the space um you know there's companies and individuals that are you know behind the scenes are doing fantastic work um, to kind of push forward um, change and also you know kind of you know bring the industry together in you know more you know real life and important matters but generally speaking uh with the moment you know particularly around sort of black communities and stuff i you know it's something i mean i could be wrong i mean this is just my experience is um i haven't seen much so that was kind of the message mm-hmm. behind it was kind of you know what are we really doing to kind of support black communities what are we really doing to kind of making sure you know they have their voices heard there's more inclusion in them you know in kind of you know senior positions and you know roles and um and sort of you know what you know with the industry and there wasn't really enough of it and i guess you know coming yeah for someone who's a black um you know i'm a black um you know muslim and an african um you know and a journalist as well write about you know performance marketing from a global perspective it's um you know i you know it's something I haven't seen. So, uh, you know, I was like to say we need to, it's basically a call to say we need to do more. And the way we're going to do it is, you know, let's, let's start, let's start the conversation. Uh, let's put some ideas forward um, and let's be proactive. Uh, that was the messaging behind it. But I, it was, I guess, um, you know, kind of combining my personal experience uh, kind of growing up. Um, and yeah, I have experienced racism and discrimination. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I have uh, mm. grown up um particularly as a kid sort of grow, grown up over the years um and you know and i've seen it i've seen it you know with my own eyes with other people that in you know in broad daylight so it's kind of you know it's a very personal and emotional matter 
And I think, you know, what happened in, you know, in recent weeks, you know, just kind of elevated that. And I think as an industry, you know, you know, being it's, you know, so resilient and robust and, you know, it's very relationship based industry, you know, we, you know, it's very young as well. You know, it's, you know, it's, you know, I mm-hmm. think the average age is around 25 in the industry. So you, you got a lot, a lot of young, ambitious people bringing in really great ideas, coming out with some great technologies. Um, you know, I could go on, you know, for hours on this, um, you know, and I think, you know, we've got all these great things about the industry, you know, you know, and we can do this. I think there's no reason why we, you know, we can't do more. Um, or we can't, you know, we, you know, we can do the same when it comes to when it comes to kind of supporting black communities and just general diversity. Well, I appreciate you sharing that with me, Mustafa, and and uh, it breaks my heart to hear, you know, real stories of, of or not real, but stories of people I know uh, that have experienced racism, and and as a <laughs> As a, a white forty-five-year-old with uh, that was blessed with every privilege, um, you know the world uh, values. Um, it's so hard for me to to understand that I, I, I can empathize to a degree, but I, I can't understand. And so, uh, what I know to do is is like like you said, have conversations. And so I appreciate you uh, sharing that with me. Recently, um, I think it was AS uh, Affiliate Summit. Um, in Europe had an all, uh, or, or, or attempted to have an all women's lineup. Um, do you see things like that as part of the more we can do? Um, should a conference, you know, really focus? I loved what they did. Um, we, we don't, uh, you know, uh, uh, women are a, a segment of our population that, that, um, is marginalized as well. So I was all behind that. I thought it was a fantastic idea. We even had, uh, two of our, um, uh, our amazing talented, uh, leaders here, um, uh, apply and, and, uh, I, I'm blessed with two amazing sisters, um, and, and they also uh, applied to speak. So do you think it's, is, is, you know, for a lot of people that ha- are in uh, in power and have that privilege, it's very hard for them to understand. I think, and and it's been difficult for me. Is what is the more that we can do? Is that kind of along the lines? Like, should we have a a conference where um, you know people of color are all the presenters uh, to give that opportunity and that inclusion? Do you think that's part of it? Um, I think so. Yes, I think to it. A- I think to a degree. Um, so I, I'll, I'll focus on the good points of that. So yeah, re- referencing affiliate summit, um, I yeah I did attend their online event uh, for sure, and yeah I'll give credit where it's due. I think mean, when they announced it at the time, they were doing a whole all female speaker lineup um, for their show. I I know it had um, you know people. It's a very bold and extreme approach. I you know I, I I'll give it that, and but it paid off. It worked. Um. I know it had some, you know, it it does, it did have some criticism. People say, you know, you know, you're excluding entire, you know, you know, group or you know, or segment that kind of thing. Um. But no, I think that you know they they stuck to their guns and and I think it worked. You know, I I tuned into the sessions and you know the quality of speakers I think were great. You know, particularly on the performance yeah. affiliate marketing side. There's there's people I know um from companies that I know and also that um that I spoke to on a journalism level. Um, who were presented for the first time. There were a couple of people there who presented for the first time. And I think um, they all did a fantastic job. And I know in the build up, you know, there's been, you know, there was, there was training and support and, you know, all that kind of thing. So everyone was kind of, um, you know, got, got all the support they need every step of the way, but, you know, in the build up and, you know, prior to the show and at the start of the show as well. Um, so I think, you know, credit where it's due. I think it's, you know, Affiliate Summit, um, Affiliate Summit uh, Europe uh, did a good job with that. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, as I say, that's kind of uh, one way um, I would say in looking at it. I think, um, yeah, I think, you know, that's kind of one one avenue. But I think at the same time, it's like, I, this is kind of where I kind of, you know, I might be a bit critical here. It's, you know, that's that's all that's all good and said done, that approach. Um, and I think, you know, you know, doing more physical stuff at conferences, you know, even with PI Live, you know, um, you know, we're sort of, um, I remember last year, you know, we, we vowed to do a uh, 50-50, you know, male and female um, kind of representation, um, you know, across our panelists uh, for, our, for, for our panel sessions. And I think, you know, we did a good job with that. Um, and I think, you know, that's something, you know, definitely in terms of conferences, there's been huge, there's been huge criticism that, you know, if you go, 
you know, you go to a session of panelists, you always see just a your usual kind of CEO male representatives. And I think people are yeah, very, yeah. very tired and sick of that. Um, and like now I think, you know, it's taken, a, it's taken a, you know, a few discussions and stuff. And I know there's people actively, um, there's one group I mentioned in the sector that do some brilliant stuff at the moment, but in terms of, um, you know, it's getting better. And, um, you know, yeah, you, I, you know, even with these virtual events that have happened in the last few months, the representation, you know, in terms of, you know, who's on the panel, people are speaking generally as one-to-one -one sessions. It's been great. I think, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of great female speak, not even just female speakers, like, yes, I say diversity, um, more, you know, sort of um, inclusion and more sort of, there are, yeah, black, uh, black representatives and vice versa. So it's, it's been better, uh, of course. Um, but yeah, I guess my critical point I was going to say was kind of with, I'll use Affiliate Summit Europe, uh, Europe as an example. Yeah. So yes, I think the approach they did was great. And, you know, the show, show was really good. Um, you yeah, know, full credit to them and, you know, fantastic speakers. Um, but that was, you know, the event, I think it was about a month ago now. Um, and I, and this is where I kind of, this is kind of where I, I raised the mark here is kind of, you know, I feel like the buzz has just stopped since then. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like, right, it's been a really forward thinking approach of, you know, bringing more uh, female speakers to the spotlight and they've done it and it's been great. The feedback's been great. Um, the show, you know, the show executed was well, but you know, it's been three, four weeks now and it's kind of like what's happened since. Um, so yeah. it's kind of just gone silent. You know, is it like, oh, that's just a one-off thing. It's, it's done now. Um, and I think that's kind of where, you know, I think, you know, I think it's good to kind of, you know, be, be ambitious and put, you know, be forward thinking. But I think there must be a way we need to maintain it. I think, you know, we've got to keep, keep the consistency up. Um, and I know, um, as I'm going to mention, as I mentioned, there's a group, uh, they're called Turn the Talk. So, um, it's a small collective of um, sort of industry leaders uh, from sort of platforms and agencies here in the UK, uh, female led as well. Um, and they've sort of been working really hard in terms of kind of bringing more facilities and sort of discussions and plans uh, to encourage more diversity and inclusion in performance marketing. And, you know, some of the things they've done is, you know, introduce workshops, um, you know, on areas of public speaking. So people who haven't spoken for the first time at all, um, no matter what background you are, um, you know, male, female, um, ethnicity, whatever, um, you know, completely open to you, and, you know, you, and you, you sort of learn the trades of, you know, being comfortable, how to speak, you know, what the key skills, that kind of thing, yeah, yeah. very friendly manner as well, you know, it wasn't like a big intimidating, um, you know, 500 people in a big workshop, it was kind of like a small uh, collective workshops they did around sort of 100 people or so, um, very relaxed manner, very laid back. Uh, but yeah, those are just, yeah, that's just one example of what they've been doing, but it also been sort of um, doing very small projects as well. Um, and also, as I say, getting involved with the kind of conferences um, and sort of, you know, just basically just working with, um, with you know, as many people as can to, um, you know, to kind of, you know, bring more representatives going forward. And I, I, I know they've got some great plans coming up, uh, so stay tuned. So they're called Turn the Talk, um, if you want to check them out. Turn the Talk. Uh, yeah. Um, T O R Q U E. Yeah, T U R N T H E T A L K. Okay, good. <laughs> I I was misunderstanding. This is the the that's where the accent came in, yeah. and maybe hopefully that's the only mistake I make today. Okay, <laughs> turn the talk. Uh, awesome, and we'll include that in the notes. You know, one of the things that I've been doing, and that video was I I couldn't make it through the whole thing. Um, it was so. I, I've just been educating myself and taking it as it's my role to be, to educate myself on this situation and look at my areas of influence. I run two businesses. What am I doing to make sure that uh, women and people of color and any marginalized class um, that they're not being overlooked in, in those areas that, um, that I have that influence in. Um, and, and so we were looking at hiring, uh, and, uh, the first step of the process, um, you know, we're removing, uh, names. So we're not, uh, you know, our own, um, unconscious biases come into play. And I, and I think, you know, for our listeners, cause a lot of it, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, in your mind, but a lot of it is, is making sure the opportunities are there and, uh, that people of color 
um, get those uh, opportunities and, and those at bats. Um, and so the people listening can uh, can get educated on what their systems and processes are for for their hiring and their um, advancement and promotions and education and training of staff. You know, are there areas where they are limiting that opportunity uh, for people of color, or or there's something in the system that's making that uh, that happen? Um, that seems to be a big area that in, in, as far as like, what can the industry do um, in your mind? Is, is that correct? Yeah, I think, I think you've got it there. I think you got it right there already. I think, as you mentioned, it's, it's, it's a system thing. It's, it's systematic. Um, so, you know, what's been happening uh, for years now, it's all been ingrained and systematic um, across the board. And, you know, we, you know, we. I guess we could all be at fault um, here to a degree. I guess you could say, you know, you can't blame, you know, all these, you know, all these, you know, companies or black, you know, companies and vice versa, um, in terms of their policies and what they, you know, what you know, what they've been doing, you know, up up till now is, you know, that's just that's just how it's been, you know, um, you know, it 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 is it's, it's rooted for years of years of kind of uh, repression and vice versa, and it's just been ingrained into society, uh, no matter what what industry it is you know this is you know yeah. it's it's across it's across um, all platforms um, across the board so it's like um you know it's only taken um these last few weeks really for people to really kind of wake up and kind of realize oh right we need to you know ensure we educate ourselves and ensure, let's review our processes right what what do we have in place um you know should we be training our staff you know should we implement this should we uh, being incorporating these policies into our main strategies, that kind of thing, and you know, thank you know, luckily or not luckily, uh, thankfully, you know, a lot of companies are now, um, you know, I've been looking at sort of you know agencies, and you know, I, I think I've been on a couple of websites and stuff, and they all, everyone's very, you know, they've all put official statements out there saying, you know, this is you know, this is what we're doing, um, in terms of you know how we're supporting um, you know, diversity and inclusion, like through through their training, through recruitment, through um. You know, just their initial policies um, and vice versa. I was actually, um, I was like, one of my friends is currently is looking for looking for work at the moment, and I was just looking browse around for a couple of uh, jobs around uh, around for him to pa- kind of pass over. And I looked at the job application, and I think the first, literally, the first paragraph was actually saying, you know, I think it was mentioned, um, you know, you know, we're doing all we can to support, uh, you know, diversity and inclusion. This is, you know, this is what we're about, and that was the first thing. Not even before straight into the job description was literally that was their first mm. thing. I was like, you know, it just took me away, and I think you know, it started. To, it, people have started to listen, and people have started to make make changes um, and integrate um, policies. And I think you know, from that, um, you know, as it continues to adjust and people you know incorporate this more across the board, um, then you know, then you know, eventually people's strategies, uh, you know, will will prevail, and then people within those companies will. Um, you know, will will be better representative, and I think people, new people that will come bo- on board to these companies, uh, will you know will be you know will be valued and you know, um, and yeah, kind of I guess kind of be be you know be welcomed in that sense. So yeah, I, that's kind of how I see it really. But then there's also the element where you've got, you know, I, I know that's been like you know I think it's like reporting on the drum and stuff like you know you you got a lot of um, for example like yeah you know, brands like Ben and Jerry's for example have been absolutely fantastic mm-hmm. uh, throughout the yeah year. yeah so of um, you know the messaging and and what they're doing you know to support uh, black communities and stuff and what they're doing as a brand you know they've been they've been strong advocates when it comes to social issues over years uh, but particularly they've been fantastic whereas you've got some companies who would kind of just you know, they'll just put statements out for the sake of it or just jumping on the bandwagon and that's that's not good if you but then yeah. if you go on their website or you know you check their like their team and it's all like you know it's all just you know what white people you're like whoa okay so you mentioned uh you mentioned like um you know you put a bit of a, you put a statement out but then like you know it's like are you just doing it for the sake of it you know that's that's yeah. where you know that's where i kind of cross the line it's like you know, some people have to kind of jumped on the bad wagon, whereas like that's not that's not the way. It's all you need to you need to be proactive rather than reactive um, in this in the sense of it. So um, yeah, as it kind of goes back to what I just said, kind of back to what you just said. Um, it's kind of people are sort of kind of you know realizing now 
um, and then they're working their butts off to kind of ensure um, from the ground up um, that they've got all these sort of um, mechanisms and policies in place to ensure everyone in their business is trained up on on sort of diversity inclusion as a whole, not just black communities, but generally as a whole. Um, and yeah. also, um, yeah, just make sure it's just ingrained, really. And I think that's it. It's go, it's, it's go back to educate ourselves. And, you know, even myself, you know, I say I, I am, a, you know, I'm black in ethnicity, of course, but, you know, I educate myself all the time. I mean, particularly even these last few weeks, you know, I've been reading a lot a lot about, you know, what the Black Lives Matter, black Lives Matter movement have been doing. Um, yeah. And also... Um, generally just just resources i mean i i've I've read probably way more (laughs) than i ever done really um in in that regard so i'm 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 of course i'm also educate myself um and sort of i'm hopefully you know and aiming and i want to uh through my professional work uh through performance in and also the music blog as well um to ensure that we you know we 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 do our best and make sure everyone that's involved with us is you know is prepared and educated and you know, well, you know, making sure we provide a full representation um, of our audience in the industry. Well, I appreciate that, Musafa. I, I learned a lot there, and and I, you know, I'm I'm no expert in any of this, and and I'm I'm just a a dude trying to uh, wade through it as well. And for our listeners, I, I would just encourage you, like Mustafa said, and I said, is is educate yourself. Um, there's such a political divide in some of these things in the states. Uh, and I, I don't understand, you know, um, loving other people, seeing other people hurt and empathizing with them at the very least sure doesn't feel like it takes a lot. Uh, it, it's a risk or it costs you much. And that really, I think, is the beginning of understanding and then um, understanding, you know, can lead to, to change. So if you're listening, get educated. And um, uh, but one of the things uh, I was excited to talk to you is you have a really unique uh, view from anyone I've interviewed yet on the industry as someone covering the industry. So we have been dealing with uh, COVID uh, and the pandemic. Um, what, you know, with that view, uh, what have you seen that changed, has changed in the performance marketing space? Uh, since, uh, you know, March, when this really became an issue. Uh, I guess in the States, uh, it became a, a big issue in March. I think it was uh, uh, in in the rest of the world earlier than that. But what have you seen changed in the space since then? Oh, um, oh it's, yeah, we could be here it's a, a while. It's <laughs> <laughs> a big question. Um, I've, I mean, from the conversations I've had, um, with Pullman Sim, we've done quite a lot of uh, Q&As with people. Uh, so, you know, with uh, various advertisers, publishers, um, and sort of um, agencies, platforms as well. So, I mean, I think it got really good um, representation in terms of you know what they've been saying, what what they've experienced. I remember, I remember at the start, it was kind of, I guess it was a massive panic mode. I remember, you know, obviously with Amazon's you know yeah. closing their uh, commissions program, and everyone was like, oh no, what's going on? Um, and then. You know, everyone just suddenly pulls their affiliate programs out of nowhere, and then like you know, affiliates were losing out of revenue. Um, advertisers, you know, they were just sending out really, uh, you know, very short, you know, unexplainable comms, you know, to say, oh yeah, we're to pull, you terminate, we're terminating our uh, program or we're pausing our programs for kind of no reason at all. And it was just like, I mean, it was a period of panic, and then I think, oh, once things kind of settled, um, and kind of, I think, you know things kind of became a bit more clear and I guess you know from their companies um kind of been a bit more proactive in terms of their strategies and kind of introducing more um elements to support their clients so I think in terms of I mean one of the biggest things I I've noticed and kind of what I've seen from clients um is obviously there's a lot of verticals that have been shifted um you know so basically online on, you know with everyone being stuck at home um, so the world of e-commerce, I mean, e-commerce is basically just blown up. Um, it's basically yeah, yeah. End, like five years, <laughs> essentially. Um, and like, um, as I said, you know, some a majority, uh, the good thing about affiliate marketing, it's always been a very um, profitable channel, but also it's always been very technical channel. Um, so it hasn't, you know, the, the fact that activity online, you know, is a skyrocketed, if anything, that's, you know, it, it's benefiting the industry. And I think a lot of companies have adapted very well in in that situation um in terms of um kind of support supporting their their clients through this time so i you know i've seen companies kind of introduce more um you know robust kind of um analytic tools and you know in terms of 
um as they like e-commerce so you know moving your entire kind of uh, digital proposition online and focusing more you know kind of direct to the consumer and you know and voucher codes as well like the voucher codes um coupon space has been incredibly interesting to see um you know i think there's one com- one publisher um that's what they're like an, an interactive innovative kind of discount uh platform for NH- nhs workers um yeah so we've had our mm. healthcare workers been working tirelessly over this last few months to deal with with COVID patients so it's kind of been you know very innovative and also very current so i think you know people have been very innovative in that sense and i think it's paid off for them and i think you know it's been that shift of um you know massive shift of online uh but also seeing you know you know companies um like the a ones the racket and advertising the uh the impacts and that was and you guys as well actually you just kind of um you know with the webinar we did with you know we partnerized about a month ago you know you guys meant you know we ran through the different verticals um and then the sort of five top five strategies um you know kind of yeah focusing more cross channel device tracking and vice you know that those kind of elements yeah. is you know it's being um yeah it's just being you know proactive run and sort of just you know panicking you know that we have yeah that there was a moment of panicking but i think that's kind of you know settled down now um and i think the good thing about the affiliate marketing industry is um is very resilient um and, and you know it's always been about partnerships and relationships and i think you know i think you know this kind of brought it back to the core really and just you know look assessing your partnerships and programs and like right okay we're going to make sure that everyone gets through this you know we'll make sure everyone's supported and i think you know everyone's done that and i think you know you know you know with the you know what's you know with the shifts and stuff and you know the products that have been introduced i think people have have, have done incredibly well um but also it's been an opportunity for new players and kind of partnerships to come through you know there's been a lot of startups you know that otherwise went around uh before covid have all sort of just kind of popped up into the space um so it's brought a, a lot more new players into the mix you know i know like influencer marketing uh so you know content creators have kind of come much more forward into play because now they can you know they you know they they uh they use online to create content loads so um so this has actually been their bread and butter really and then sort mm-hmm. of that coming into the world partnerships um mix now um and you know looking at that on a performance level uh that's been another sort of game changer as well um and also you know there's been shifts in terms of budget and you know where marketing budgets are going and thankfully i think affiliate marketing has been one of the marketing channels that have actually benefited i think you know more people uh you know are investing in affiliate marketing um, which is, you know, which is good. Um, I was just trying to remember this recent stat from the IAB was, um, back, you know, last year was, uh, I think it's 5.8 million was, mess- you know, was kind of um, invested in billion marketing last year. Um, I might have got that wrong. I do apologize. <laughs> but, 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 but it shows the channel, that's in the UK, but it shows the, you know, that's just the UK alone, but it's showing that the channel has been invested. And I think particularly these last few months, I know I did a recent interview with Partner Centric as well. And, you know, they were saying, um you know affiliate marketing is just you know for, for them it's been fantastic you know for their clients it's been great they, they've had return of investment particularly during this tricky period you know whereas like our other marketing channels like display and you know ppc have not necessarily worked well so you know if anything i think it's actually put affiliate marketing more on the map i think it's, it's made it more dynamic so um yeah so since since the response has been it was panic at the start but i think now as things have yeah. settled and you know what's online um sorry the trends now that you know things are shifted online certain verticals of you know have got ahead compared to others i think you know the companies in the space have just been very responsive and they've been you know with the products and tools they brought out i think you know the clients have benefited so yeah i think i think the industry is in a good place um so yeah i think they've done very well yeah and you know we we saw people take one of three actions um paralyzing they just they were paralyzed they didn't do anything they they uh, uh, we're not expecting this. We're not prepared and didn't move in either direction. The other was, uh, close everything and retract and save as much money as they possibly can, irregardless if the channel they were closing was a profitable generator and would be, would continue to be. And then the, the third way was, you know, a reasoned approach to a shocking, uh, uh, moment and, and situation and and some things needed to be closed and i've been uh i started in this in 99 so i'm almost uh 21 years in the space and 
I, we've been through, I've been through some recessions. And the one thing I always noticed is the affiliate channel does really well during these times. I think part of it is during that time, we've had a natural progression to e-commerce, you know, more of the market is going that way. But I, I also think, you know, with affiliates, when they're doing, they, they do so many different things and you can, you can, if you wanted to, you can engage only in the affiliate channel and your affiliates could engage in all the other channels. And I think that provides uh, some emotional safety in choosing what to spend your budget on uh, because you're not spending it on display that you won't know until later if it works. Whereas affiliates, you're paying for it after you have a sale. And so I think that's another natural reason why people right now are moving more into the affiliate space because they can feel more comfortable about where they're spending. And it, it is a big deal to incur the cost after you uh, incur the benefit. Um, and so that's one of the things we're seeing. Now, going into the future, what are you hearing? Um, one of the things that we're, uh, we have a lot of travel clients and they're looking at um, really at not returning to any sort of pre-COVID uh, levels and activity until June of next year. Uh, and so, you know, different industries have different things. But what are you seeing um, as you're covering this space uh, about what people are saying going forward? Um, I think saying going forward, I think um, things, well, going back to normality to a degree or the new normal as um I guess we've, we're calling it here. Um, I think, I think, as I mentioned earlier, I think the massive shift is, um, you know, I think going forward, I, I can't predict the next 12 months, but let's say the next 12 months, I think there's going to be a hybrid um, of, say, online and offline. So it, it's, it's getting to that balance kind of, you know, between online and offline and, and essentially, you know, tailoring your strategy to that. I think, you know, People are going to still be, you know, the moment, you know, some as we sort of all go outdoors again, you know, and I'll look at retail as an example. Um, you know, retail stores are now open. Obviously, there are kind of restrictions and distancing measures measures in place, but there will be people slowly kind of going back, you know, um, come back to that kind of, you know, in store and purchasing. So it's, you know, it's having that kind of um, physical element, but then also. There's going to be a lot more, as I say, online. People are still going to be shopping online. So e-commerce is, yeah, as I say, it's jumped ahead by five years. Um, so essentially, I think mean, it's just been proactive. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, the industry has always been a relationship-based industry. I think the way I see programs, I think, for example, with affiliate programs, I think they're going to be way more diverse now than they ever were. Um, you know, with just with the partnerships in place and just, as I say, new partnerships and content creators um and also just technologies in play um i think you know going forward i think you know there's much more opportunities now to kind of um you know enhance your um performance strategy um in that sense and then also you've got the uh, i guess the analytics and the tool side you know with people people on their smartphones uh way more i mean that's another thing as well you know people constantly on their smartphones it's kind of it's kind of having more tracking solutions in place um i think we might i think we touched on this um in the webinar we did and also we actually did a panel on this with the networks as well um was you know what they're doing um as a united approach in terms of you know providing more um in-app in -app tracking uh capabilities uh for advertisers so they um can sort of uh, you know in increment these sales that come through from in-apps and i think that's going to continue um going forward so it's just being ahead i think on the on the sort of technical technological side of things so i think it's going to be you know as consumers going to still be reserved and will eat but slowly easing back i think it's going to be that transition of um having much more diverse partnerships um so not just having your sort of limited uh restrictions but being a lot more open with your partnerships you want um and basically just kind of expanding more of your um performance uh kind of revenue opportunities really so that's kind of that and then i guess lastly um kind of pay attention to new technologies and partners as i mentioned there's been a lot more startup players in the in the space that popped up in the last few months um kind of strategies and you know i think performance is just going to become more and more important than ever before so become much more incremental um and yeah i think you know we'll all, i think we'll emerge from it stronger really uh we're going to do a podcast series where we deep dive with each network on the incrementality and attribution tools that they have. I, I agree with you. I think that's 
uh, going to be a big deal uh, uh, going forward. And a lot of prospects that we meet with, you know, their biggest concern is knowing if that sale needed to have the affiliate channel in it, in that customer's path to purchase. Uh, and they're unaware of the myriad uh, tools available uh, to target that. So we're, we're excited about that. Uh, Mustafa, I have enjoyed this. I know it's late where you're at. Um, and I thank you for spending the time at, at the end of your day. This has been an enlightening, encouraging, uh, and, and really fun conversation, uh, to have. It's been a pleasure to, to meet you with, uh, during the webinar and, and spend some more time, find some, uh, cool things we have in common. I really appreciate you taking the time today. No, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I say I don't get often not get asked to kind of share my um, insight and kind of have just have these conversations. So no, um, no, thank thank you for inviting me to the podcast. Uh, no, it's 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 been fun. Uh, I hope I hope I've shared. Um, some good insight that people can take on board, I guess. No, definitely. And I bet it feels different to be on the other end uh, of, of the conversation. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to it. Now, um, tell us uh, if people were wanted to follow your writing, they wanted to get a hold of you, where should they go uh, to, to read what you're, you're putting out and then to communicate with you? Yeah, of course. So um, I guess, yeah. So on Performance Sin, I mean, feel free to reach me out, um, mustafa.mirror at performance um yeah if you want to reach me out in terms of anything affiliate uh performance marketing related news and vice versa just conversation you know what just conversations if you want to have a conversation with me um probably linkedin actually is a good shout as well i have conversations all the time on linkedin um especially during this period so yeah mustafa mirror on linkedin um yeah feel free to connect with me drop me a message um you know let's have a chat uh for sure um and then yeah music wise if you like to see what's happening in uh uh, wonderful city of Bristol, but also the UK. And we do cover some US stuff as well, actually. So um, tapthefeed.com is where you want to check out the music side of things. Awesome. So we will include links to all of that in our show notes and make that available for everybody. So uh, Mustafa, again, thank you so much. This has been great. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time. And hopefully uh, we will be able to meet in person sometime in the near future. Yeah, for sure. No, thank you. Thank you again, Jamie. Um, no, thank you. Thanks again uh, for inviting me. And yeah, it's been fun. I really enjoyed it. So it's been a great pleasure. Man, Mustafa, again, thank you so much for joining me. I learned a ton here and uh, hopefully I was able to walk uh, through and, and not stumble too much some of these uh, more difficult and uh, sensitive conversations. But thank you so much. And I hope you as a listener got a lot out of this. I want to encourage you again, get educated on these issues. Uh, if, you, if you don't want to, maybe that's when you really need to start reading other sources. And there's a lot of great books out there. Uh, and a lot of good writing happening right now to bring you up to speed. Uh, but I learned a lot in general about affiliate marketing and performance marketing. I hope you did too. Just want to remind you, if you need help with your affiliate program, you can go to jpcommerce.com slash strategies and get your 20 tip guide for affiliate marketing strategies to survive and thrive right now. And that guide includes 20 videos that are emailed to you outlining each of those topics uh, more specifically. So if you like this podcast and this episode, please share it on LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter. Uh, you can also go to Apple Podcasts and give it a like and give it a review. And we're available on Stitcher uh, and many other platforms. So if you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. Give us a like and a review on all those podcasting platforms. 